Never. No. So you're saying you just, uh, what, you, what, just bought a crib in Scottsdale? Yeah, I just bought my first one. Congratulations, sir. Yeah, I was renting in the Envy in Old Town. Mm -hmm. I was there for my first three years. How was that? It was cool, like. Yeah, was it challenging with all the Old Town madness? I mean, like, I'm born and raised here, so uh -huh. it really wasn't anything new. So yeah, like, you're used to it. Yeah, Old it was town, just Old more Town for me. quite literally got old. You know, literally. <laughs> I mean, like you, like yeah, it doesn't change. Oh, I already know. Still to see the same people, like yeah, that I've been seeing since yeah we first started going there, like in yeah. college. So good spot though, like knowing tons of athletes. It's dope to this is a dope place to be an a professional athlete, and like yeah. to have that scene. Obviously, it's in season, you're not bullshitting, but right. just to have a good vibe, you can go have fun, let let off steam. Yeah, like like there's some there's some teams and in, in cities where like if you do want to go celebrate a big win, there's nowhere to go. No options. No you vibe. Have, you have nothing to do. Yeah, there's something about it. Like say what you want about the party vibe, and like obviously there's it's a slippery slope and it's negative, but when you have a lot going on. And you're able to release and be around a lot of good energy, good music, right? Nice people, everyone's smiling, having fun. There's yeah. something to be said about it. Yeah, and for it's real. a place to where, like, especially for us, like, <laughs> when you're playing six months out of the year, and then the off season hits, like, some dudes can't wait to get out of the city they're playing. Like here, people, guys live here all people come around. here, and to people live. are like, I'm staying here, like yeah. I'm buying a house here, like this is where I want to live. So, so what is? I mean, that's pretty interesting. I want to say James James Conner. Our homie who we were just talking about that was one of the first conversations i had with an athlete where i realized like growing up in a place you know like you're obviously a football player growing up you're probably a fan of the cardinals you know if you go see those games what's that like actualizing like that childhood dream where you actually like comes full circle it's crazy you play you play for the hometown team yeah it's crazy i mean like football is the most I mean, any professional sport, right? Like, mm -hmm. but I know for me, like, it's been so full circle, like, dudes that I've grown up playing with. Like, I, I have a teammate, Byron Murphy, who mm -hmm. we were played together at Saguaro, and now we're teammates for the Arizona Cardinals. Like, that's the stuff you would never think. It's and crazy. so I remember, like, coming back here after playing for Texas A&M, getting ready for the draft and combine training. I had all my bags packed come draft weekend because I thought Very I was going to go here. get drafted somewhere else. And then... 602 number popped up on my phone and Steve Common, the Arizona Cardinals are calling me saying, hey, we're bringing you back home. I'm like, Crazy. damn, I'm back. I was sleeping. My parents just moved into a new house. I was sleeping on the floor of my mom's office for the first two weeks of OTAs. <laughs> like I love literally that. going home like from OTAs, NFL training camp. My parents asked me like, how, how was your first day of practice? Like them still cooking wow. me meals. Like it's what it was, a vibe. I know, right? Like what a vibe. I was living good. I was living for free. And then, yeah, living with you know, the I had, fam. Too. I had to go. I had to go find somewhere to live. But like it was, it's just crazy, you know. It is. It is. And I feel like that's something. Mike, Mike, real, sorry to cut you off. Uh, can you take your necklace off for this? Yes. One? Yes, I sure can. That's why I'm wearing headphones this time. Oh, that's smart. <laughs> Hear it loud and clear. <laughs> he does it all. I give it up for John Kilmer. Sound mix. <laughs> I'll lose Producer. that fucking necklace. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, man. I mean, I was an athlete growing up, and just like from rhode island so boston red sox i was a baseball player so the boston red sox like that was like you know to have that actualized and be able to play for the red sox i didn't make it there obviously but that you know it's just a really interesting thing it's a dope thing do you uh in regards to like these things that happen in your life and and uh this is something i talk to about with all the athletes um when things these happenings occur in your life like that you know like one getting drafted actualizing a dream but then having to be full circle you're running out in the field for the for the home team are you able to detach from those moments and like whether it's in hindsight or in the moment itself and and actually kind of celebrate that either what you know with yourself or just in your head you know the understanding that like you know there's there's a billion there's eight billion people on a planet very 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 tiny minuscule percentage of people get to do these types of things yeah. Are you able to do that? Are you are you in that headspace? For sure. Like, I I definitely realize and recognize that like I'm a one percenter. You're a one percenter. Yeah. Like, successful people in this life, like we're all one percenters. Like, mm -hmm. when you do something rare that not a lot of people can do, like, yeah, you got to realize that and you got to appreciate it. And like for me, like I definitely do celebrate it. Like I'm not, I don't shy away from like you know really being able to celebrate and enjoy like. Mm -hmm the the fruits of my labor and mm -hmm. because it's not like i was born and it was just like boom i'm an nfl player right. like 
I had to go through so much adversity. So and much. Yeah, like, you know, I had both of my parents growing up and, like, I come from a great family. Like, I may have had the upper hand, you know, mm-hmm. more than some other guys. But, like, I, shit, I still had to work hard. I still had to hit adversity. Like, I had to go through all the same things to get to where I am. Mm-hmm. So I'm not quick to forget that. Right. So, like, I still definitely will always take a second to, like, appreciate that and celebrate it. Still. But I'm one of those people, man, like, when I, when I like have a big game or like I accomplish something else that's like another stepping stone, like it makes me hungrier. Like, yeah, I wake up the next day. I'm like, what's next? Like, I got it. Like, I got to go get it. You know what I mean? And that's, and that's, that's why you're here. And like, we were talking before we came on, it's kind of the the premise of this, this, uh, this podcast itself is just like, I mean, I'm not a fucking podcaster, media right. personality, but I read this book, Think and Grow Rich. If you haven't read it, you should read it. Um, I put people on books every time they come on. Yeah. Um, give you homework. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the concept is essentially like, we talked about this last episode with the dude and the Yankees, but the concept is essentially a guy was hired 100 years ago now, the 1920s, to study all the world's most wealthy people. At that time, there were no billionaires, I don't think, but there were multimillionaires. He was hired by one of the uh, Carnegie family, which is you know, one of the more wealthy people in the world. And this guy for 20 years studied, got to hang out. Steve's so bossy, nah, it's insane. Like, dude. Basically studied hands-on, learned from all the most wealthy people, took all of his learnings, all of the data, all of his habits, and made a guide to what made all these people successful. And that's kind of the idea of this in a modern way. It's just like the thing you just said reminded me of it. It's just like there's certain things that I hear every time I sit down with an athlete here or an artist or anybody right. I sit down with, anyone getting wins, it's not, it's like, you know, when you arrive there at that next place, it's really just looking up to the next place. And, and it's, it's a, you know, my mantra is like, keep going. It's never, there's never any, stability is the wrong word, but it's complacency. You yeah, know what I mean? It's sure. just an understanding that, they, hey, you know, I've done the 20 years of work or the 15 years of work to be here. It's kind of an expectation that when it arrives, you're like, okay, you know. And that's why I led with that initial question, because I find athletes in particular, but myself, I came from an athlete background, but I had trouble and I had to reset and kind of challenge my own thinking a little bit, because there's a very slippery slope on that side, too, where nothing's ever enough. For sure. Really. And you can, and you can almost like, you can self-destruct by doing that. Absolutely. Because then it's like... Like, that's not good enough. I didn't do good enough. Like, mm-hmm. when it becomes not good enough, and then you start pointing at yourself, and you're like, I'm the reason why that's not good enough, mm-hmm. you can self-destruct. Like, Absolutely. I'm my own worst critic. I'll, yeah. I'm not afraid to say that. Mm-hmm. In college, at moments, and I had to learn this, like, it, it comes from experience, but, like, in college, like, it, I used to eat myself a lot to where, like, it was to the point where I wasn't confident in my game anymore. Absolutely. And it wasn't that anybody else was saying bad things about me or that, you know, oh, Christian Kirk sucks. He can't do this. He can't do that. Right. It's me going back after a Saturday looking at the film. I'm like, damn, like, I'm still not where I want to be. I'm still not where right. I want to be. Like, can I play at the next level? And you know, I battled it my rookie year, battling injury. Like, mm-hmm. my whole couple years of my, my, my NFL career so far, I've like, been battling injury. And it's like, I had to get out of that space. Like, like you said, like when you are getting wins, mm-hmm. and it's even the little ones, like you got to celebrate those. You got to recognize exactly. how big they are, and like how that helps. It's little stepping stones getting mm-hmm. to where you really want to go. Yeah. Ultimately. Back to that book. The title, the quite literally, is "Think and Grow Rich." Essentially, the undertone of the whole thing, the secret is, it's all about your thoughts. Right. So when you have those thoughts of self doubt, self loathing, doubting, you know, doubting your abilities. Your body hears that. The universe hears that shit. You know what I mean? And it's just what, subconscious. Like, subconscious, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And I'm I'm a big proponent of kind of training the subconscious the subconscious as much as you can. Um, now, I should at least intro you for, for for the listeners. This is Christian Kirk. He's having a fucking breakout year. Uh, I went to the game. I'm never gonna go again because that was that was what was that the second <laughs> loss or the first loss of the year? Second loss. Second loss. Out of a, a, a very win heavy season so right, far. So right. I'm no longer, <laughs> we're no longer going. We had a good time. You're just bad luck, bro. Yeah, I think I might be. I think yeah. I might be. Right. James Connor, your dog, and yeah. my guy, he's, I think he was the third episode on this on YNK. Yeah, third or fourth. Good buddy of mine. He, uh, 
we were talking about it off, but he, he came to, uh, what year was that? Probably 2014. Right was I, Mike Stud. I was Mike Stud before Mike. Right. And uh, right when Mike Stud was kind of going up and, and getting a little juice, we, we showed up in Pittsburgh. This was 2013, I believe, like the first time I was on tour. And we get a te- I get a DM from the Pittsburgh football team, <laughs> college kids. And they're just like, yo, you know, like it was sold out. They're like, yo, we want to come through. So I didn't know him, but I was just like, of course, you know, like kind of had this synchronicity with athletes everywhere we went. Like right. the athletes were kind of the, the people that made it. It was like a niche fan base that kind of spread the word for Mike Stead. You know right, what I mean? Because right. I, I was coming from an athlete background, had sports references. So we always took care of athletes wherever we went, that type of shit. He came, had a good time. We got to see the tits and ass in the front row. Yeah. <laughs> Mike, fun fact, that show actually technically kidnapped someone. Do you remember that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We were wild boys at this, at this point. We're in a Sprinter van, not even on a tour bus, right? Yeah. And we get kicked out of a hotel. My buddy, I got kicked out of so many hotels in the middle of fucking nowhere in Pittsburgh. And, and uh, James wasn't with us, so he's, he's out of the story. <laughs> out of the story. Let's, let's, not let's clear the air. He has not an guilty. alibi. Um, yeah, he has an alibi. <laughs> um, but yeah, you did. What, what did we end up doing? We ended up having to leave the hotel. Well, our buddy Huey was like, yo, we can go to my mom's place. It's 15 minutes away. Which was really 55 and there's minutes a pro- away. Like, you know, everyone's funneling out of the party, and this girl is just standing there. It starts pouring raining. And this girl's just standing there in the rain. I'm like, uh, do you have anywhere to go? And she's like, my friends left me. And I'm like, ah, we're only going 15 minutes away. Come with us. Meanwhile, we're not going 15 minutes away because our boy Huey fucking lied to us. We went an hour and a half away across state lines. Was it that in, long? Into West Virginia. Across straight line, Across state lines <laughs> is the dagger here. And she was from Baltimore. <laughs> yeah. She was from Baltimore. And, and she got the... And then what happened? I, walk us through what got happened. Got a very angry uh, call from her mom the next morning. Don't know how she got my number. <laughs> how did your mom get in contact? How did her mom get in contact? I don't know how she, her mom got my number, but... Uh, well... Basically, uh, we, we had to leave the next day. I left her at Huey's place and we just dipped and... Uh, and just let him handle it. And the, the mom and uh, some cops showed up at his doorstep a few moments later after we left. <laughs> <laughs> Were there, were there any charges pressed? No, the cops were like, this shit happens all the time, man. It's not a big deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and mom was freaking out. Yeah, of course. Yeah. That's a little baby, you know it's what I mean? Comedy. It was a, it was an earlier time. A simpler time. Earlier times. <laughs> simpler times. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, that's where we met James and then really caught caught a vibe the second, third time I came in. We went out, you know, he was on the Steelers at that point. Yeah, yeah. And we we, we took it up a notch, went went and right. went and ran it up in Pittsburgh. Yeah. Good dude. Good yeah, dude. Great dude. Since the dawn of time, men have always loved to chug beer. In the old times of Bavaria, the men of Germany would spend their Oktoberfest drinking out of a festive beer stein. In the 1980s, fraternity brothers all over America spent their Greek week pounding beer out of a funnel. And for the last four decades, the world went silent. Then came the Chug Bud, the new revolutionary way to chug a beer. With the combination of a beer bong and a shotgun, this drinking device is scientifically proven to help you chug your beer quickly and easily. Oh, and did I mention it fits in your pocket? Go to ChugBuds.com and use promo code YNK69 to get 10% off your entire order. That's ChugBuds, C-H-U-G-B-U-D-S dot com and promo code YNK69 to get 10% off your entire order. ChugBud. Your beard just got a new best friend. How, uh, getting back to this year and the year you're having, talking about your, your mental, this is, that's kind of like, I'm not going to talk about football, really. I just, I want to understand um, where, when, when, when these breakout type things happen and you're having, you know, there's obviously a lot of factors that go into, you know, even, even down to the system and the other players and the ecosystem, but what would you credit from your perspective or from your just internal being, uh, wh- where, where's the, the success coming? Is it one of the things where it's just, you've gotten your feet wet, you're, you're accum- you acclimated to it, or what do you think? You know, like, it, there's a lot of things that contributed to it. Yeah. And, you know, I, I mentioned it, like, my first year, my rookie year, uh, we were really bad. I mean, mm-hmm. I think we got voted the worst team of the decade. Wow. We were that bad when we were last in every category, and um, it was my rookie year, and we just—I think we went three and three and three and fourteen, mm-hmm. three some something crazy like that. And it was a tough year. I broke my foot against Green Bay, mm-hmm. 
Um, week 12 was the first time I've ever been hurt and missed a game in my career. So that threw me for Rattling, a yeah. Yeah. And then I came back my second year, had an opportunity. Um, this is when Kyler and Cliff first came in and, you know, they were leaning on me to be the guy. And, you know, week four, I had a high ankle sprain, pretty mm-hmm. bad. I was going to need surgery, but I decided not to just rehab it back. I missed four or five games and came back and kind of lost my confidence and I wasn't a hundred percent and, you know, just had some plays that I should have made and didn't make. And, you know, I started questioning my abilities, if Mm -hmm. I could play in this league. And then, um, my third year, you know, they brought in D hop and they brought in some other guys. And, um, you know, I kind of almost, I, I, I was still an intricate part of the team. Right. But for me, you know, I could kind of see, I know how the NFL goes. Like, if you don't produce, they're going to find a way to, mm-hmm. to phase you out. And mm-hmm. we had just drafted three new receivers, and I was kind of getting the feeling like, you know, I got to step my shit up. So, mm-hmm. you know, I had a decent year last year and nowhere near in this type sphere that I, I knew I could play. Mm-hmm. And so this year, like this offseason, you know, I'm not a big I don't really look into social media, look into what people are saying, but it's inevitable now. Like mm-hmm. social media is like yeah. our, our life. Like that's what we do. We do everything on there. And to be honest, like I haven't really, I haven't really talked about this to anybody. So like, this is the platform. It's the platform for the homies. I mean, this off season, I really sat back. I mean, we drafted another receiver. Rondell Moore is a great player for us. Going to be a great player for the Arizona Cardinals for a while. Mm-hmm. But you know, I kind of just sat back in the whole off season. And just, like, the fan base was really just crushing me. Like, Mm -hmm. we need to trade Christian Kirk. He sucks. He can't catch the ball. Like, just bashing me. Like, just really acting like I I haven't done anything in this league when I feel like I've done a lot. I've made Mm -hmm. big plays and just really were trying to, like, just kind of bury me and try to get me out of Arizona, trying to, you know, just talk down on me. Not one positive was said. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I I was like, you know what? I'm going to keep tabs of all this shit. Like, And I feel like as a man, and for me, like, I'm so competitive. Like, I'm uber competitive. And, Mm -hmm. like, I'm not not somebody who's going to sit there and let you walk over me. And as a man, if you're going to, if I feel like it's disrespect, there's a point where that line is drawn Mm -hmm. and then enough is enough. Mm -hmm. And, man, I made a decision, like, going into the summer, like, enough is enough, bro. Like, when training camp comes around and the season comes around, like, I'm t- like I'm taking over, and I'm really gonna show everybody wow. the type of player that I am and how I I know I can play. Like this shit gets me fired up even talking about yeah. it. And, like I've been using that every single game. Like wow. it's like I go to even go to practice and I go into the game and like you know it can be a little little drastic, but like I'm like fuck everybody, bro. Like mm-hmm. you know who you are, you know how you can play, and when you line up on Sunday, it's either you or it's me, mm-hmm. and like. The way I operate, like, it's going to be me. Like, I'm not letting you take food off of my plate. Absolutely. Because we're both here to do our job. We're trying to win. But at the end of the day, like, this is how we feed our families. This is how we provide. Yeah. And so, I don't know, man. Like, it's just a, a fire was lit in me. Um, and it was almost just like I just had to draw the line for the disrespect. And that's been, that's my, interesting. That's been my mentality. So, switch went off from the negativity. It just, like... And usually, like, I would always just try to comp- compartmentalize it and be like, oh, they're just haters. Like, they don't know what they're talking they don't about. Know like, shit. They don't know shit. Like, and, and That's they don't. actually factual. Yeah, they, they really don't. You know, they really don't. But, like, I wasn't doing anything with it. I was just trying to put it away. But I was like, I can use this. Like, there, there's something here that I can use. It's interesting. I can use. And when I saw what it did for me, I'm like, oh, yeah, I got it. Like, That's interesting keep going. because, you know... You're essentially taking negativity and there's a usefulness of it. You know what I mean? Like making something, making, taking anything that actually really occurs, no matter what, even if you're not an athlete, anything, you make mistakes, you know, the, whatever it may be in your life, taking the negative, whether it's an event, whether it's people, whether it's, you know, what people are saying, commentary, taking that and extracting the usefulness out of it and using it as fuel I mean, I feel like athletes probably do that better than anyone, you know? But, you know, that's the first time I've heard it like that, where, like, you literally just sat back, took it all in, and kind of a switch went off, which I think is really, I mean, it's a really dope way of taking something that's kind of negative 
and fucking lighten your light your fire. You For know? sure. I mean, because it can go one or two ways, right? Like it can. It can. It can. You can use it to the way I'm using it, mm-hmm. and I'm not saying I'm the perfect case study. Yeah. Or you could just keep letting that shit bury you. Like you mm-hmm. can just keep letting people throw dirt on your name, dirt on until you're you're gone. Like, and there's also a negative side to it where you get consumed by it. You know what I mean? And and then when you have this negativity and you're not actually using it towards the proper direction, right. you can kind of get gobbled up by it. You know, yeah. like even your subconscious, what, what are you feeding your mind? You start exactly. kind of believing it or, you know what I mean? And yeah. it's dope to see you just kind of completely say, let's go. Yeah, it's just it like, it's just, it, it's like I said, it's just fueling me. And like, mm-hmm. I feel like the key is just not forgetting it. Like, and it's, it is easy because I had a lot of success early on in the season Mm -hmm. and it could have been easy for him to be like oh you know now everybody loves me now everybody's like oh christian kirk in his contract year Mm -hmm. different player he's amazing we love him i take back all the things i said about him it's like no like Mm -hmm. i remember what you said like only thing that changed from now and six months ago is i'm making plays that you said i couldn't do right and now all of a sudden you want to praise me because the teams went in i'm playing good i'm helping win games but it's deeper than that for me. Mm-hmm, like, mm-hmm. I, you, nobody expected me to do shit. Mm-hmm. And now that I can go out there and prove everybody wrong and I get the opportunity to do that every single Sunday and prove that I'm the player that I am, like, that's why I have a good game. I wake up on Monday morning. I wake up, like, I can't even sleep because I'm so ready to get back to work. And, like, I'm wow. like, bro, what's next? Like, I got to go a great, get it. That's a great way to be feeling, though. It's you know great. I mean? In a league yeah. that takes... I mean, I want to dive into this a little. I feel like I don't really when I've had NFL guys on. The challenge, like, you guys are, like, fucking another breed of man. You know what I mean? Like, gladiator type, freak athletes colliding at the fast. Like, I'm having trouble getting out of bed. I'm like, oh, I played fucking beer pong last night. You know what I mean? Like, the fact that you guys are are really, like, I want to dive into it a little bit. Just, you kind of you sparked it when you said, like, getting out of bed. Like, how... Put us, put us on the field. Like, I mean, I know this is your your being and what you do, you know. So it's like it is what it is. There's a normalcy to it. How fast are things moving out there? How's the how hard are the hits? Like, how's the body feel? You know, when 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 you're out there, is the adrenaline so high that you know? How is it the day after? You gotta imagine it's pretty fucking brutal. You know, like walk us through it a little bit. It's it's because uh, you're not a, you're not a big fuck. You know, you're on a small no, I'm side. No, I'm small. So you gotta have yeah. this like. A, it's like a freak mentality, obviously genetics as well, you know, and then training, but. Yeah, no, I'd say obviously majority of it is mentality. I mean, because, you know, I'm small, but like mm. when you say that, like I think of a guy like Buda Baker. I'm not sure if you've yeah. like, seen him play, but he's one of the hardest hitting safeties in the league. And he's 5'9", yeah. 190 pounds. Mm. But I've seen him make hits where I've been on the sideline and I'm like, I want no part of that. <laughs> like you can, you can feel that. Like I was telling James, I was talking about James because like James is a bully. Like he is, he is a bully. Like if you were to, I was saying in an interview the other day, like if you were to meet James and just talk to him, you're like, oh, that's the most humble, sweetest. like sweetest guy ever. Like chill. But if it's you and him in the hole, and I've seen him run at some dudes and lower his shoulder, I'm like, oh my gosh, like. You, you like I, I play receiver for a reason, like because there's no way I'm stepping up at safety and trying to tackle James <laughs> Conner. Like I'm not doing that, you know. But like Sheesh. I still, they still ask me to go across the middle yeah, and know that smoked. a safety's right there to just take my head off, like yeah. you know. And it's that's that's the mental part of it. That's why they say is like 90 percent of it is mental because you know if I was scared to go across the middle, I would drop nine out of ten 100%. balls that are going to me. But you just you got to forget that. But I would say like. For me on TV, for me to say that it looks slow on TV and yeah. for people to say that it's fast when they watch it, you wouldn't even imagine what it's like if you just were in between the lines yep. and you see how fast guys are moving. Yep. I mean, you got guys like on our team, we got Isaiah Simmons, who's 6'5", 230 pounds, and he runs a 4'3". Like human human physics, like you're that not, that's sense. not supposed to be possible, yeah. you know, and like He's running 20 miles per hour tackling guys. You know, it's like, yeah. And they say, they say, like, when you get hit, especially NFL, it's equivalent to being in a head-on-head car collision. Yeah, 
Yeah. So like people ask like you know how how you like you ask how, how does your body feel in the morning like go take your car 20 miles an hour with your boy <laughs> raving into each other about about 20 30 times and yeah. then get up in the morning and see how you're feeling like so so are you often going into a game on Sunday feeling banged up and then when you get out there it's just like fuck it for sure crazy like, adrenaline kicks in yeah I mean we do I mean I I go through I get to the stadium like. Three hours before the game, mm-hmm. I'm probably warming up for like an hour and a half. Mm-hmm. But adrenaline kicks in, like you got the little smelling salts. Like yeah. you, you, they got so much stuff for you that yeah, once you get out there, it's like it's all gone, you know. Mm-hmm. But we always say, like our, our strength coach always says, like day one after training camp, he's like, welcome to the last day. You'll be a hundred and hundred percent crazy, and that's July twenty seventh. Crazy, you won't be a hundred percent until February. Wow. You know? So like. Yeah. Everybody's got something. Everybody's got a thumb, an ankle, a shoulder. Like just a bunch of tough motherfuckers, man. It's just, but it's, it's insane. It's addicting though. Like it's yeah. It's something that like you guys are all tapped players. a little bit, a little tapped. It's yeah, yeah. It, it, there's definitely like yeah, like a screw loose up there. Before is there a party the that likes getting drilled? A pause. <laughs> <laughs> Yo. <laughs> Yeah, and he was just like, man, I don't know. I just like getting hit. Yeah, Danny's you know? crazy though. Yeah, like he, Danny's like, yeah. So you don't want to get hit. Yeah, you know. No, I, mean? I mean, I have to. Like, I don't settle into the game until, until you like, get hit. I get hit. That's and cool. Even like, if I catch the ball and get down, like that doesn't even work. Like, mm-hmm. I got to get my bell rung a little bit. Yeah, or, you know, take a hit to to really settle in and be like, all right, I'm good. It's interesting. No, what's the dynamic in an NFL football locker room? You t- tell me. Uh, that's another question. I feel like I I ask these questions because I've been I've been in baseball locker rooms at a pretty high level. I know that dynamic. Uh, just uh, just a different dynamic in football. Being all these dudes, very fucking big, strong. There's a lot of ego in that sense. Like I'm not saying the guys have ego on your team, but just like what it takes to be an NFL player. You know what I mean? Like. You've been a badass your whole life. You've been that right. dude your whole life. Yeah. Put them all together from all different walks of life, you know, and you're talking about the biggest rosters really in all of sports. Exactly. So explain it a little bit if you can. Yeah, I think like you made a good point. Like it's unique in a sense because the roster is so big. You know, you got guys from all over the place. Yeah. So many different age groups, like mm. from 35 to 20 years old to and what makes it different is, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but like the NBA, like it's such a small roster. Yeah. All those guys, like, especially if you're starting five, like the pay is not that much different. Like you're making the bag regardless. Yeah. Like if you're in the NBA, you're on NBA, you're making the bag. Like mm-hmm. MLB making the bag. Yeah. Like we got guys that P squad guys that, yeah, in a broad, like it pays like a, a, a good job, but you know, they're making a couple hundred thousand, yeah. you know. After you know, taxes and living life, taxes, it's, it's, it's still, yeah, so it's, it's not. Low, yeah. So you got guys like that that, you know, are still trying to get it that, you know, bottom end, they're making a couple hundred thousand. Then you got a guy who's making 27 million a year. Like, and it's, it's that's, that's a, that's a very different lifestyle. Like, oh yeah. NBA guys kind of all live the same lifestyle. Yeah. MLB guys kind of all live the same, Fair, yeah. you know, but. And then you go into like different position groups and whatnot, like, you know, offensive linemen, like QBs, specialists, like mm-hmm. DBs, like it's not, it's not clicky. Like some locker rooms can be clicky. We're good. Like everybody kind of mingles. Everybody kind of does is, is cool with one another, yeah. but the dynamics, like the personalities are just all different. Yeah. And it's, that's why people say NFL locker room is one of the most unique places in the world you can be it in. Really because is. You're going to get a little bit of everything Yeah. from all people all over the place. Yeah. I mean... You're obviously spending more time with your position group, you know, yeah. and study and drills and shit. So that's natural. Yeah, that's natural. How's uh, how's the big boy JJ Watt? He's a, he's a new he's a new addition this year, right? Yeah, he's a new addition. Unfortunately, he got hurt. He's oh, uh, he, yes, he's been hurt for what half the season or so. Yeah, they're you know, unfortunately, right now it's season ending. But oh, it is. Yeah, you know, oh. I know, I know he's I know he's grinding to you know if there's somebody who could try to possibly yeah. get that out of the way it's jj you yeah. know if if you know we're playing a super bowl or mm-hmm. you know we're going to the playoffs you know he's going to find a way to try to get back mm-hmm. but you know, he's grinding but like dude is is a certified like real deal leader like love that definitely came, like definitely came in and like you know everything you see on the outside like even me like i could only judge jj from the outside because i never played with him right but once he came in like genuine dude like 
but definitely change like the mentality and the culture of you know so, how to lead and like really being able to, to to speak to different guys and just be a good teammate so he's he's been good for yeah us. yeah yeah has um now kyle how old is kyler this is what third year fourth year this is third year so he's, he's me, so young me but it's crazy me and kyler were in the same class coming out of high school and we both committed to texas a&m so wow. we, we played we played one season together at Texas A and M before he transferred to Oklahoma. I didn't know he went to A and M. Yeah, so wow. he was at Texas A and M for one season, transferred to Oklahoma, and then uh, obviously that's why I was a year ahead of him. And then mm-hmm. that's that, that's another thing how football is so full circle. Yeah, like who would have thought he gets drafted back to the Arizona Cardinals? Now he's my QB again. You wow, know, like crazy. He's he's twenty four. Um, yeah, young. So he, he saw enough of he saw enough of Northgate, real quick. He just got in, and got yeah, out. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't think he really rocked with Northgate like that. I would have to always beg him to come out. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Lost a lot of good men out there. We yeah, did a lot of good men. We've had some good times in Northgate. I, I, I think my, my my Northgate days might have been a little better than my Old Town days. You know, that's you were a little G, more. Gino know about Nor- Northgate. Gino is always in Northgate. You touch that soil here yeah. and there. Yeah, Gino touched that. Gino knows what he's doing. He's yeah. Yeah, it's a good time. Over there, it's a good buying, time. over there buying drinks for a dollar fifty. Like, I mean, you wouldn't leave. I mean, you, you, it would be hard to spend more than twenty bucks. Being I want to say after the show, this is what we do. Like when we're on tour, we'll, you know, it'd be like I'd liken it to you, like grabbing the mic after a good game. Yeah, and just be like, "Yo, all the hot bitches, I'm going right next door to the bar." Come on, <laughs> yeah, right, <laughs> you know right. what I'm saying? Yeah. So I'd be like, you know, we would do that, and we just like go bullshit and party, and actually like immerse ourselves in the community. You know. For that night, more or less. And I remember my first time in Northgate. Uh, I want to say Blue, my boy, almost got arrested uh, for, I think, public indecency. <laughs> he was getting busy somewhere. <laughs> um, but, man, like, I want. I remember vividly going to a bar and, like, like, you know, I was just starting to get the bag. You know, Do you remember so, which one? Um, you go upstairs and it's like a club and it's like... It's 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 pretty shitty. It's like a low ceiling. Yeah. The DJ, I don't know the fucking name. Oh, it's probably John, a, Johnny's brought me there. It's probably one five one. Yes. Yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 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 We're in there causing a ruckus, you know. <laughs> and and I buy I buy the whole bar, you know, shot, you know, do shit like that just for the vibe's sake, you know. And they're like. Sixty-eight dollars. <laughs> you know what I mean? It yeah, was just yeah. so fucking cheap. I was I like, "We'll get another." <laughs> but you yeah, like good vibes up there. Good vibes. We got to talk about A and M. I mean, it's the fucking house that Johnny built over there. You know, I'm a Johnny guy. Yeah. Uh, he, was he? Was he before? He was a good ways before. He you? was uh, two or three years before me. So he was out, and then. But if he had stayed, it would have been a year or so, right? Because yeah, he left like what? It'd been like a year or two. Yeah. Um, but I mean, he was. I mean, for all of us, uh, for shit, America, he put A&M on the map. I know, he did. I, I didn't know, like, I didn't know Texas A&M until he went there and started balling. And Crazy. one of my high school coaches was like, yo, have you seen Texas A&M play? And I'm like, no. They're like, I got this quarterback. Like, this, they got a spread offense in the SEC. Like, and I was an SEC guy. I always wanted to go play in the SEC because yeah. I was like, if you want to go to the NFL, you're going to go play in the yeah. SEC. So I was like, okay, I'll check him out. And I remember... I think my first game I watched him, he was playing uh, Louisiana Tech. He had a crazy game against Just Louisiana follow. Tech. And I was like, oh, yeah, like, I like this. So I remember mm-hmm. following I remember following Texas A&M. And then um, my boy out here, Kyle Allen, who plays for Washington football team, mm-hmm. he's about to take a visit to go go check it out. And uh, I was like, shoot, can I come along with you? Like, mm-hmm. I just kind of was like his guest. I showed up, went for a little unofficial visit. I was kind of like his friend that they kind of like, we're like here, yeah. Take a jer- like yeah. have, take a picture in our jersey. Like they were more interested in Kyle, and they're like, you know, send us your film. We'll check you out. It's more like a sympathetic thing, and they checked me out. They're like, oh shit, this they kid, this it. kid's real. Like, and so they came out, started recruiting me, and interesting. Yeah, I fell in love with it. So you would say Johnny had a little tiny piece of maybe oh, your I story. Mean, I, I, seriously, I would not have started watching A and M because of Johnny. And you may, maybe wouldn't have visited, and maybe. That's really dope. Yeah, it That's was dope. dope. How, yeah. Did, did you, do you recall or do you remember, I mean, obviously a notorious guy. Right. Notorious Northgate guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Uh, what, what was the overall mood and vibe like when you, when you go, put yourself back there just about Johnny and, you know, like, do you remember? I mean, I know he's a wild motherfucker, but obviously did so much for that community. Yeah. Know? I mean, like, 
the dude the dude <laughs> walks on water over there like yeah, it's johnny manzel over anything you i've know? been there with him and i'm just blown away it's nuts like i remember when because obviously he wasn't we weren't there at the same time but i remember when he'd come back for a game we'd go to that same spot 151 he'd sit in the corner bro there would be like for real a <laughs> line of people that would literally like walk in the booth like walk past johnny walk out like yeah they just wanted to see him like or yeah. people were doing as much as they could to even just like get a glimpse like yeah the place would be packed out all of northgate would try to be mm -hmm. coming in because they knew johnny was there mm -hmm. and they just i mean yeah. still, still to this day he's a love, legend man oh, legend. and he's like you know i don't know if you saw I, we have a podcast to do bought on lie where mm -hmm. the first season we finished already but we, we just kind of talked about him and what it's been like and you know kind of a, a real honest like unfiltered look into like who he is yeah. and like what makes him tick and where like you know obviously the trials and tribulations and really what it was you know what i mean versus and it really what it what it was about for him was like couldn't he had to be honest with himself you know like no one really knew the truth because he really couldn't tell the truth until he told himself the truth you know but what a good have you spent time with him yeah 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 i see like i see him a lot more now you know it's a crazy thing um when i was coming out uh, i had my pro day at texas a&m mm -hmm. and this is when all the scouts come yeah especially for guys that you know weren't able to go to combine so i did my on the field work there and we didn't have a quarterback coming out of that class and this is when johnny was coming his comeback. so i literally hit him i was like johnny bro like it'd be an honor i really appreciate it if you would come back and throw my pro day he's like let's do it like let's get it love that and so he trained he got ready and he he killed that shit and it was probably smoking cigarettes in between <laughs> tables. <laughs> Couple <Right. table> crushes, <laughs> drinking blue boys <laughs> <laughs> all right let's do this shit. Right. Right. <laughs> northgate the night before yeah man. yeah no i mean that that was like that was a cool day for me like that's dope just being able to because that's a big ass day and like, clearly it went big, well yeah it was big for both of us so yeah not having him do that now that he's back in az like yeah we're both here like always always talking to him chopping it up and love like, that you know seeing him so good love ass, that good ass dude guys. yeah teamwork science diversity equality family friendship nature the environment america patriotism OnlySteves.com. Um, I'd love to. How far are we in, Kilmer? Like thirty-five minutes. I love the. I like. I, I want to jump past. Just like, I like doing this. Just like with 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 the guys who sit here. Just like, give us just a little. You can go as detailed as you want or not. Just like a little nutshell of of just. I know you're from Arizona, mm -hmm. but just like walk us through. Because you know you said a few things in there that were interesting to me. And it's, and it, you know, thinking about you and your size and the things, you know, I have a good buddy, Marcus Stroman, who's a major league baseball yeah. pitcher, yeah. Um, very undersized. Yeah. And, you know, that chip on his shoulder that it developed for him. But like, I know that feeling. I can even relate it to like my career and what I do and like how long it took to feel like I earned respect and like, you know, kind of that there's like there's there's that divide amongst you know athletes or whatever where like you come up the ranks and there's those there's the highly touted guys right you know like when you said i went to AM, they're just like kind of sympathy like oh well, you know yeah. give me your tape um kind of rings a rings a bell for me and just like i love to hear you know because that's that's been a staple of 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 your your you coming up it's just like constantly proving people wrong not being the guy that's super celebrated, but you just put your fucking head down and get, you know, and, and, and kept elevating. Right. Um, even to this season, you know, like another time where you're being underappreciated, doubted, you know, and, and you kind of you lit the fire under your ass. So I'd, give us a little nutshell, just like coming up. Um, and again, you can go as detailed as you want, but you can talk, tell us about your family. I know you mentioned your parents. Yeah. You have siblings? Yeah. So I, I got uh, two younger sisters and then um, my, for my dad's, um, previous marriage i got um two older sisters mm -hmm. and an older brother uh i have a niece or two nieces mm -hmm. and a nephew how amazing is the niece and nephew uh, especially when you don't have your own kids right and then like like the coolest thing is like i'm the cool uncle yeah like, like i'm the uncle that they're yeah, like yeah, are yeah. lit to go see so like Love that's that. all that's always awesome i'm but, the same yeah <laughs> <laughs> but uh 
no nah, man like i grew up obviously with both my parents and um very structured household mm -hmm. my dad's ex-military um mm. my mom is my mom is one of the most successful business women has as built and grown into one of the most successful wow. business women here in, in, in Arizona. Um, my dad owns a automotive detail company in Scottsdale Air Park. Yeah. Um, but like early on in life, like like where I get my work ethic and my mentality, like I, they never gave me anything. Like whether it was, hey dad, like can I, I don't know, like go to Circle K and get a thirst buster. Like, you gotta do go go cut the yard or like go pick up the dog poop and the you know like the commodity exchange. If you wanted something like you gotta do something do some, first to yeah. get you know to get to get that and so like that's just that's all I know now. So like I know if I want to get something like I know I have to do something to get that in return. You know and Dope. that's the way that I operate. And so I actually this funny story. I always tell this. I started playing football when I was five years old. I was too young to play in the youngest division. So my dad, they were they were calling like, "Hey, we can we get your son's birth certificate?" And he's like, "Ah, oh, just I lost it. I can't <laughs> find it." So they like he never gave it to him. So I played a year younger. It was like eight year olds, and I was five. You know, mm -hmm. just playing with these kids. Just he wanted to get me into football, and um, you know, I started playing. And uh, there was one game where at the end of the season, the coaches let you know us play whatever position we wanted to play and I was playing like right tackle the whole season and I was small <laughs> the five-year-old yeah like dudes are just stepping on me I'm kind of sideline crying and yeah. I was like I want to play running back and so the coach is like I mean all right it was like fourth quarter a couple minutes left hand it off to me I go score my dad had the chains and he's running down the field with the, with the <laughs> chain thing so they do it again I score again so I had two touchdowns they're like all right next season we'll put him at running back so from that point on I played running back all the way until I got to high school. Like, mm -hmm. I was a running back. Favorite player was Edron James. I loved Reggie Bush. Like, I just was mm -hmm. all running back. And, um, you know, like, my name started spreading around Arizona. Like, mm -hmm. there's this kid coming up, and there were some high schools that mm -hmm. were recruiting me and whatnot. And my, my youth coach at the time started coaching at Saguaro, um, which is down the street. And that's mm -hmm. how I ended up going there. And, you know, I was five seven a buck 60 you know my freshman year yeah. at that buck 50 and i remember my dad's like you know what's what's your goal going into high school like what do you want to do and i'm like i want to play varsity as a freshman and he's like all right well if that's your goal like you got to make it happen mm -hmm. you, you got to pick the right school to go to you got to pick somewhere to, to give you the opportunity and i remember we met when met with the varsity coach at the time and i was like i want to play varsity as a freshman he's like not happening like mm -hmm. and i'm not sure you know who dj foster is yeah so DJ was the only, he had played varsity as a sophomore and he was like the closest. And he's like, we haven't had a, a freshman play varsity here. And since I've been here, like it's not happening. So the high school level of high school football here is pretty high. It's gotten really, really good mm -hmm. since, I mean, shoot, since I've graduated, but it started a couple years. I mean, there's been good high school football players coming through, but right. now it's like they got- The culture of it. Yeah. yeah. And so I remember he sent me to varsity camp I was a freshman, only freshman to go to varsity camp. They were like, you know, putting my my clothes, they were putting like baby powder in my shoes and like my helmet and like mm -hmm. hazing me and shit like that. Like, <laughs> you know, like making sure like, yeah. I, you don't want to be on varsity. Yeah. And, you know, I went in there and did my thing and I ended up uh, like three games into the varsity season, I ended up starting. <laughs> I made uh, like all state, honorable mention. As a freshman. Come, yeah, as a freshman. and. Caught two touchdowns in the state championship game, and you know, that's when some teams were like, you know, or the, some some college teams were like, "Oh, this kid, you know, you got a freshman playing on varsity and balling." So my first offer was from UCLA, the old offense coordinator that was at ASU, uh, just got the job at UCLA, mm -hmm. and he kind of was like, "Well, he's balling. Like, who knows how it'll turn out in four years?" But sure, we'll offer him. Like, fuck oh, it. they offered you early. Yeah, so I got my first offer my freshman year of high school. My freshman year of high school. Wow. Yeah, and then ASU was like, sure, we'll jump on the bandwagon, and they offered me too. So I had UCLA and ASU <clears throat> after my freshman year, and from then on, it was like, all right, you know, do I just want to be like a good high school football player, or like, do I want to, because they got so much shit now. Like, you can go travel and do the camps and become a five-star. Like, right. it depends on how much you want to put into it. Right. And me, just like, 
one and everything that is out there, I'm like, Dad, I want to be a five star. Like, mm -hmm. I want to prove that nobody else is better than me out there. I want to prove I'm the best receiver in the country. Like, why do you think? Um, have you ever thought about why you think you're like that? I'm just like, I, I, I'm, I'm somebody. I know why. I'm somebody like if I'm gonna do something, it's like it's zero to a hundred. Like if I'm not gonna do it, I'm not gonna pay any attention to it. I'm not gonna do anything. Mm -hmm. But if I'm gonna do it, yeah. like I'm going to give every waking second to do it to make sure that I'm the best. Like it's just the competitive nature in me. Like I don't go out there to just do things right. to be another guy. Like I want to be considered the best. And can you pinpoint a time where you switch went off and you realized uh, this could this is going to, could be and will be what you do for a living. Like, you know, it's one thing to be, I didn't know, I didn't know you had gotten offered so early from yeah. big school. So yeah. that must have did a lot for you in regards to just that affirmation yeah. of what you thought of yourself. Yeah. And like, I didn't, like my story, and that's the thing, like my story, I didn't, like, I'm not the guy that, oh, I was, you know, five, five through my junior year of high school, I was a two star. I didn't have any offers. And Mm -hmm. Texas A&M gave me a sympathetic offer. That wasn't how it was. Mm -hmm. You know, I started having success early. And, you know, I, I, I think it was like I started going to these camps to where all these, like, national prospects were going to. And, like, kids that were two classes ahead of me that were five stars, I was going out there and killing them. Mm -hmm. And I was winning MVP at these national camps. And mm -hmm. Nike holds this. this so you're really, you're really him. You've been him the whole time. <laughs> You know, too. It's just I, about you, you. It was just a decision I made. Like I was just like, yeah. I, I want to go out here and prove to these people that I can compete on a national. And at the time, like there were some good guys coming out of Arizona, but like I wanted to put AZ on the map. Like I wanted. All I heard was like, oh, AZ. You know, if you're from the West Coast, you can't go play in the SEC. Like mm. you know, the 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 South has real football. Blah blah. blah. Like I'm hearing all this stuff, and like right. very similar to where I am now. I'm like. Okay, like Fuck I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go prove you wrong. Yeah. Like I'm not hearing nothing, nothing you're talking about. So that was my goal, and so I went to all these camps, played in the Under Armour All American game, and you know, killed it there. Like, and just kind of knew, it. and so committed to go to Texas A and M, and you know, that was a big step. And like, I just wanted to see so bad. I remember I I graduated high school a whole semester early just so I could get in there, start learning the playbook, like. Once again, I was like, I'm not coming here to register. I'm not yeah, you're just here. wired. You're just wired for it, you know. I right? just like I, I wanted what's next. Like I wanted whatever the highest goal was. I was gonna set it. I was gonna go after it. You think a lot of it has to do with your father and and the way you were raised in regards to just, or do you you really just think it was kind of your internal being the whole time, the way you're wired? No, it was definitely my parents. Um, yeah. Just because, like I said, when they made it. A point to me that whenever you want something in life, you gotta do something. You gotta do something to go get it. Mm. And like my first example, if I wanted to go to Circle K to get a thirst buster, I maybe have to I don't know take the trash out. Right. Simple ass task. Yeah. But the bigger the reward, the harder the task gets. And I started write that one down. Kids. I started I started understanding that like. If if I want these lofty ass goals, if I want to set it as high as I want to, like too much is given, more is required. Like, mm -hmm. and that that's basically what explains it all. You know, yeah. How, give us a window into the level of sacrifice that you feel like. You know, it's one thing just genetically gifted and having all all these great assets and resources and all the things you've tapped into yourself. You know, but that that I idea that you're just talking about is just like the loftier the goal the more it requires and i, and I, I like to give a window into people because i fucking personally i always shit on sports fans like when you say like these people say like fuck them you know what i mean because they have no idea what it takes they have no idea all the times they went to the movies or they went on this trip or they went to the bar four nights in a row and had great memories and great times and fucked that girl or did this right yeah. They, you know, not to say that athletes can't have, have fun, you know, which I think they do, and they do it well when they get their, their chances and pick right. their spots, but the level of sacrifice it takes to, one, maintain your body, maintain your mind, and, and to kind of do the, these lofty fucking, you know, unbelievable goals that you set and go achieve them, you know, give us a window into, in, into the level of sacrifice it's taken, you know, like in high school, in college, 
you know, I know you go out and touch Northgate when you can here right. and there, but like yeah. the level of the level of sacrifice, I think, is really something worth shining a light on. You know, because it's for anyone who wants to do these things, whether it's starting your own business and you know becoming a millionaire or doing, you know, it really does. One thing I've learned, and that's kind of the point of this whole podcast, is that mm-hmm. I respect everyone who has success, right? Because I know it's not a fucking it's it's not luck. You know what I mean? Like it's not a you can get lucky and strike gold, but it won't be maintained. People who have success and are maintaining it for, you know, when you talk about, even in your case, just like, you know, proving yourself in Arizona, then proving yourself at Texas A&M, proving yourself now for the, in the NFL. It's just like level, that level of ma- maintenance where you're at a high level and you're maintaining it, none of that is an accident. No matter, even in, like living in LA, we would, you know, like people would shit on like the YouTubers, you know, because it's, or like TikTok or anything. People, these kids have get famous and have these, you know, great businesses as young kids. Yeah. And a lot of people's first reaction is hating on them. Right. But the guys who are really doing it and really elevate and stand up, like really kind of, there's, there's some guys who fizzle out, you know? Yeah. That's the nature of the whole thing. Right. But the guys who really do it and establish it and maintain it and grow it and evolve it, it's not an accident, you know? And, and I think there's a level of sacrifice, you know, ranging and from athletes to that. There's, different sacrifices to be made but shine a light on in in your life at least you know what role that's played in you and your decision making yeah no I mean it definitely comes with a lot and you know I remember being in high school and like I was very highly recruited and a lot of eyes on me and whatnot and I learned like real quickly that like I'm not just a normal high school kid anymore Mm -hmm. and like there were times where I was like man screw the football stuff like I just want to be a normal kid like Mm -hmm. I want to go I want to go to these parties like I want to go and you know be able to do everything that everybody else does go hang out after school and you know kick it on the weekends and you know do whatever everybody else does but Mm -hmm. I had to realize like you know this I chose this like yeah I chose this and now that I'm here like you're gonna reap those great rewards exactly and you know you can't like you can't ask for it and then all of a sudden when you get it and it starts requiring a lot, you can't be like, oh no, no, I'm good. There's something to be said though, that's a really good word. Like, I don't think people get it. Like, one, you think you want to be famous until you're famous. And then you're like, fuck this shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> right, like, right. I'm trying to go eat, I don't feel great. Get right. the fuck out of my face. You right. know? Yeah. That's something when I t- think sacrifice, I'm glad you went there because that's a huge sacrifice, bro. Like, if you think about what human beings are. Fame, celebrity, that's all man-made concept. Mm-hmm. You know, like, really at the basis, all humans are one, we're all equal, you know? And like, clearly when you're a celebrity, you're not treated equal. Right. You're treated, you know, and there's a lot of pros to that. Right. There's a lot of pros to that. But the cons of it for your being as a person, one, it's very easy to get wrapped up and lose your footing and not, you start believing you're better than people, you know? But just like the challenges of not having normalcy in your life. Um, when you're a human being, you go through your own trials and tribulations, no matter how much money you have or how many people love you, sometimes the whole world could love you and you don't love yourself, Right. you know? Yeah. And, and that normalcy, thinking about being a teenage 16-year-old kid, 17-year-old kid, and realizing, having that realization that I'm not a normal kid, you know? And as you get older, it only transcends, you know? And it, and it can be very challenging. You see a lot of athletes struggle with mental health. I think it's really cool that professional athletes are shining a light my boy 100%. i'm boys with k love and he was like feel like one of the first dudes who like yeah kind of came out was just like dude i've been depressed for 10 years right. you know right um because you feel alone yeah it's very alienating yeah you feel yeah. alone very you alienating know? and you can't it's hard to relate it's hard to put yourself in other people's shoes and it's hard for people to put themselves in your shoes because they have no idea mm-hmm. and because we're one percenters yeah, you have your teammates, but you know we all know like when you have your teammates, you're not really going to your teammate and be like, you know, yeah, man, yeah. you know, like it's you. You need to seem strong for your teammate too, because at the end of the day, we're all here to win games. You know, right. blase, blase. But it's it's hard. You know, it's hard to feel like there's somebody you can go to. It's hard to feel like people are understanding what you're going through because you know you they really have no yeah. idea and there's a little bit of shame because yeah. you're like you 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 recognize that you're lucky right you know like at the basis of this all everything you've told me would point and they'd walk away from this interview and say oh man it was all it was no luck you know it was it was all hard work and i know i just said like people who have success it's not luck it's not an accident right, right. but when you really zoom out of the whole thing 
I mean, you were born with this body, with this parents, all these things. You could have had shitty parents and sure. shitty genetics. For sure. And it didn't matter how hard you work, you wouldn't be running, you wouldn't be running down the fucking field juking people. You sure. know what I mean? Like, yeah. So there's a level of that where you you recognize that and you're aware, you're self-aware that, hey, like I am very lucky and blessed. But mental health and that, that type of thing, I talk about it all the time because it's really a challenge. And like you said, being lonely, feeling lonely as a human being. That might be one of the worst things, yeah. one of the worst emotions. You 100%. could be in, I, I've been in a crowded room and felt lonely, you yeah. know, like there, there's that aspect of it. And, and when you feel like you can't really talk to anyone on a peer level, right. um, that's kind of what we try to create here, a space where that, that, that conversation can be had. Cause it's really, it's something I don't think sports fans getting back to that conversation is just like, I literally go out of my way to point it out to sports fans because I have so many buddies that play. Right. And, and I'm just like, y'all don't get These are fucking human beings. Yeah. They don't you know get what it. I mean? Imagine yeah. you in your cubicle and you fuck up and 60,000 people are like, boo, fuck you. Yeah. Right. You know what I mean? Trade them. Exactly. You know what I mean? Fire them. Get them out of here. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. And, and, and that guy in the cubicle has done so much work, so much, whatever it may have been, to get there. Right. And they didn't see any of that. Right. They just see, they take you like a commodity versus a human being. You 100%. Know? And it's, it's challenging to, to separate yourself from that, you know? It is. And then you like, you battle with the, the fact of like, you know, now when new people come into your life, you have to always build the question like, you know, what are they in it for? Yeah. You know, like, and that's unfortunate that like, you have to initially judge somebody like, yeah. you know, are, 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 like, are you here because you really mess with me? Or like, mm -hmm. do you want something out of it? Like. Right. What what are their intentions and like right. that you know that's the other wall that's up is like mm -hmm. you just automatically push so many people away. You don't, you don't even want to be like that, but it's the nature it's of the it. The nature of it. I'll challenge you. You're a young dude. How old are you? Twenty four. Yeah. So when I was twenty four, I, I didn't I didn't think about any of this stuff. Yeah. But I'm gonna give you some books to read, and then you're gonna you're gonna fucking. Read I'm a reader, it. so <laughs> I'm a reader. But, but just this, there's thing like there's. I, I believe in I believe in a way of having this life and having those having those cautions, but coming from a place of non judgment. Like right. what, it's it's almost like a you know it's 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 spiritual, but it's really just internal work. Yeah. Like these books are all like kind of I guess if you were to put them in a genre, self help in a sense. Yeah. But they opened up a lot of things where when you real like when you let go of that tension and you let those walls down. It doesn't mean you're you're penit like you know they can they can intrude on you right. on your space you know, but it's coming from a place of non judgment where really no one can impede on on your knowing your right. self worth and your knowing and no matter what their intentions are. Yeah. Not to say you don't dis disconnect and stay away from those types of people, but that internal work. Do you do you now being in the NFL in season? Obviously you don't you, you have your downtime where you really just upkeep on your body. Are you working on your mind at all at this point in your life are you i do yeah i uh i do i have mental sessions you do that work on you know just like my mentality mental health and mental yeah. training um once a week and that's and is that guitar. provided by the team yeah cool yeah and i do that and mm -hmm. shit i'm not a, i'm not ashamed of it i mean no. some some people like i you know how we are as man like yeah you know, it, that's lame it's, though, it's, like... it's lame like i don't need that or you know He's gonna go to the front office and tell whatever I said in the meeting if something's wrong, you know, with right. the team, whatever, you know, right. like I don't care. Like it, that stuff has helped me so much and really like boost my confidence and just yeah. like really help me develop and like digest, you know, what I'm feeling and the motions and stuff like that. I think sports like NFL, like the NFL, and then like probably hockey. It's a very tough guy. Like don't be a bitch, yeah. you know. Like right. where I, I do see, I do see a shift happening though. Yeah. There's, there's an open dialogue about it, but just like. It's kind of toxic masculinity. It's just like, don't be a bitch, bro. Like, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> right, yeah. you're in the fucking NFL. Like, yeah. what you, what's so hard? Like, yeah. you know? 100%. And it's, it's bullshit, you know? Yeah. So I, a lot of my guys who are, one of my best friends, I've, I've referenced him before, Marcus Stroman, is very open about how much he works on his mental yeah. um, daily. And I've just seen what it's done to him as a, be a person, a human being, right. you know? And like, how calm you become and how no one can really ruffle the feathers really, truly, because mm -hmm. you, you know yourself. Right. Someone, this quote that I came across is like, how can you know yourself if you don't spend any time with yourself? Yeah. Like, how do I get to know you? We sit down, we have this conversation. And I feel like I know you a lot more, right? Right. But how many people in today's day and age, you have a girlfriend, I yep. see, and you got a dog, and are those the only two people in your house? Yeah. So, and you got your homies, you grew up here, your family's around. Right. 
you're obviously very occupied in sports. So when you, you want to unwind, right, and you watch, watch TV or whatever you do, whatever your hobbies are, you're on your phone, whatever it may be, I see that you have a clothing line and you're, you're active and you're, you know, entrepreneurial, right. which is dope. We can, get, we can end there. But I think it's, it's challenging. And what, I, what I've learned myself, um, I've challenged myself and I've, I really am proud of myself from the development that's happened over a three, four year span of really challenging myself to spend some time with myself. That means no phone. That means nothing. You know, right. that's when you walk down the path of meditation and journaling, which I'm a huge proponent of, but it doesn't have to be to that extreme. Right. But just like really, you know, the reflection and understanding yourself, that's the only time you're really alone. Yeah. Think about think about what's happening. If you're sure. if you're girls, you're not alone. You know, like it, it's it can be it can be very challenging, especially when you talk about, you know, having a family too. It comes harder and harder with your kids. Yeah. Talked about your dog needing a fucking back surgery yeah. week 12. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm gonna need the same surgery he had. Yeah, my back for real, right? Trenches. Man. But yeah, it's, it's, it's something where I think the knowingness of yourself and your own being, like, especially I think as an athlete, the confidence and that you understand the, the value of your thoughts, you know, and controlling your thoughts. Like you mentioned it before, this is kind of the year where you said, fuck all that shit, fuck the self doubt, you know, and, and it can kind of, it'll be, where at some point physically, there's only so much you can, you can evolve do. physically. Yeah. Yeah. But then I see the guys go from here to here to here, and it's because there, there's another way to work on yourself, you know, and it's, it's up here. Because everything we have up here really creates the reality that we, that we live. Yeah, and it's, like you said, it's cool how a lot of people, especially athletes, are tapping into that, yeah. that accessibility. It's a trend, because like, it's happening. Bro, like the mind is so powerful. It and is. I, and I think it's cool, like, because a lot of people will start and especially athletes will start seeing what the mind is doing for other guys. Mm -hmm. And it'll be, like you said, it'll be a trend and mm -hmm. then it'll become a necessity. Like it'll be like, this is required 100%. in my either prehab, my, my rehab or my preparation, whatever I want to do, wherever I want to fit it into my schedule. Mm -hmm. Like this is a necessity for mm -hmm. me to be able to perform the way I mm -hmm. want to perform. That's where it's going. Yeah. That's where it's going for sure. Now let's touch on, I, I, I just, I just kind of dove in a little bit on your Instagram. You got a pretty dope clothing line. That, that is that is that all something that you're doing locally here? Or are you do you have partners on it helping you kind of yeah. navigate it? Yeah, I got partners on it, and just because of the season, like I kind of took a step back. There, a lot of people are. Work, I got a great team like working on it, and, mm -hmm. you know, developing it's it. It's like high end feeling. Yeah, looking. and that's that's what I wanted to be. And um, but Air Libre is the street that I grew up on, 44th Street and Air Libre, and so, uh, Northeast Phoenix. So. You know, I wanted to just kind of be inspired by that and tell the story of just like things like when I think about my childhood or growing up in Arizona, like, mm -hmm. you know, it's funny, like you live in Arizona, but nobody's really from here. Like I'm one of the true natives, yeah. you know, so like, you know, I wanted to be like a mix of like Southwest culture with like streetwear. And, yeah. um, you know, I have a good team in back in L.A. that, mm -hmm. you know, works on it and, and stuff. So it was a cool little venture for me to do. Um, how fresh is it? Season. Sorry? How fresh is it? Did you just start it? Yeah, it started, we launched in February. I need, um, the, I need the party packs, you know, send me, send me some. Yeah, we'll I'm get you I've got to send you some of mine too. Yeah, we'll get, you, we'll, get you, we'll get you right. But yeah, yeah, I've been doing that and um, I've been really big in like my investments and I've been investing in tech just because right. I love tech and I love the future. And, you know, obviously we talked, I talked about it like social media, but I mean, tech's going to run the world. It, it is. already is, but it you know, I love, you know, just investing in the future and, and being kind of on the cutting edge. So yeah. Do a lot of stuff with that. But, you know, always just trying to keep myself busy. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. Is that your, your biggest use of time on the, when you're, when you're off the field or you're in your off season, what are you, what are you, what are you delegating most of your time to just catching a vibe when, like, what's your vibe in the off season? Are you just more on a relaxation vibe? Are you pretty busy hustling and bustling, doing shit? I'm pretty busy, but I make sure that like relaxing and letting my body and my mind kind of decompress yeah. is number one. Mm -hmm. I, I make sure that if I want to go do something, take a trip, I want to go golf, like whatever I want to do, I make sure that's number one. Mm -hmm. But closer we get to the season and OTAs and like spring ball and stuff like that, I got to get back in my routine and make sure my body's, like I can't just like sit and just let my body turn into a potato right. and try to remold it. Right. Um, but obviously still live that healthy lifestyle and then just make sure I'm doing all the things that I want to do so I can get that out of my system. Right. So when the season comes and I just lock in for 17 weeks, I don't even want to 
you know, really go out you or go to dinners. Out. Like I don't, I did that in the off season. Like right. that's what that's for. Right. right now is about winning games and performing the best that I can perform. Yeah. That's it. You know. I met you out in Old Town, didn't I? You did. Yeah, I, I was. I was on a tidal wave. Yeah, I was on a fucking tidal wave, dog. Yeah, like bottle, bottle blonde or something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was like a day. It was yeah, like a daytime day, vibe. Daytime, yeah. 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 I think, I, honestly, I think that was one of like my first weekends back out from postseason. Yeah. You know, like, because yeah. obviously COVID and it was shut down and all yeah. that stuff. But 100%. yeah. 100%. You know. 100%. Well, man, I fucking appreciate you coming through. No, this, bro, is really, this, is, this is dope. We have, you know, I got a lot of, a lot of homies that I've spent a lot of time with, but, you know, really not, we've just kind of, bumped into each other here For and sure. there. We have a lot of mutual friends here. Sure. Great fucking group of guys out here. Like I, great, that's, great dudes. That's why I've spent time out here. Yeah. I moved from LA about a year ago and this is now my second time. I'm a nomad. Like yeah. we talked about owning things right. in the, before the cameras came on and like how, you know, it's crazy. As soon as you own things, it's almost like they own you. Yeah. Like all they, <laughs> always asking for money. Yeah, they're always yeah. asking for something yeah. and then you're putting so much attention on upkeeping them. It's kind of yeah. like who owns what, right. you know what I mean? Right. So. You know, not to say that was my outlook as I sold my house. It was really more about get, getting the fuck out of L.A. But I wanted to see new things, you know, yeah. and we came to Arizona. I, I want to say I made more real friends. You know, I have a group of guys who I've been with for 10 years that right. work with me, and it's really my only group of people that work with me. Um, but, you know, having three, four guys as an adult, man, that's, that's plenty, you know, like right. to be close with. But in, in just four or five months of time, Kilmer can attest to this. I mean, I feel like we've made so many good guy friends out here. Yeah. And it's, uh, no, I'm glad good. we got connected. No, me too, bro. Welcome to Stevenson Ranch. If, if, you, weren't, <laughs> if you weren't on, a, if you weren't in season, I feel like you would have been here by now. Just, right, probably would have. Just causing a I'm ruckus sure, I'm sure we'll be back. Yeah, 100%, yeah. <laughs> 100%. We gotta, we gotta link up when you're, when you're free and able. Yeah, no, we but, live, uh, I live right down the street, so. Do you? Yeah, and we're like eight minutes away. Amazing. Yeah, so. Let's keep going, man. I know all the fans, our fans, will be, will be fans of yours going forward. And Appreciate it, bro. I'm happy for you, man. It's yeah. uh, great timing for you to put together the best year, you know. Definitely. Go get a ship. Gotta keep going. That's yeah, it. gotta keep going. That's the main goal. Yes, sir. Main goal. Cheers, bro. Thanks. Yes, sir. I appreciate you, dog. Yes, sir. Yes, sir.